Hey guys, welcome to another audiobook. Um, today we are, this is the final audiobook of, of the, of the Puppet Carver. This is the Stitch Race story. Um, this book has been really good so far. Hopefully we'll end, we'll end it on a good note with, uh, the Stitch Race story. Um, this is the ninth one. The last one was very good. Uh, it started getting very juicy and I cannot wait to see where this goes. So, yeah, let's continue. Larson was bent over his desk, writing up a report on a manslaughter he and Roberts had cleared that morning. Roberts wasn't helping at all. He was berating Powell for bringing a Limburger cheese and liverwurst sandwich for lunch. Larson had to admit the smell was pretty bad, but Roberts wasn't being paid to be the scent police. Larson was nearly done, even without Roberts' help. He was filling in the last section when a folder landed on his desk with an audible slap. Her jaw were waiting for the, these res, yeah. Her jaw were waiting for these here results. It's about the uh, the DNA, I, I, I guess. Uh, the heavy drool lifted Larson's gaze. One of the new detectives, Chansey, Larson wasn't sure if this was the first or last name, stood next to Larson's desk. He was tapping one of his cowboy boot clad feet on the scuffed floor. Chansey was an angular guy with a jutting jaw and bony shoulders, dirty blonde hair that hung over his eyes, and a grin that looked even less genuine than his drool sanded. Chansey had joined the squad while Larson was in the hospital. Larson had heard the guy was just supposed to be a fill-in for Larson while he was gone, but for some reason Chansey was still here. This something I could get in on? Chansey said. Looks hinky to me. Is it a cold case? Larson flipped open the folder and scanned to the top page. He shook his head. It's just something I was following up on. I'll let you know if I need your help. He gave Chansey a fake friendly smile and pushed the folder aside as if it was nothing. Chansey shrugged and wandered away from the bullpen. Larson opened the folder and studied its contents. He started frowning as soon as he began reading. What in the world was going on here? Larson had sent 30 samples to the lab. He'd expected to be told they were blood samples, and he'd expected them to be 30 different blood samples. He was only half right. The samples were blood, but they weren't different. Well, they were different, but they weren't from different individuals. The blood samples, according to his report, were from the same person, but they were all from different time periods. What? This meant someone, the same someone, or the same something had bled in that pit every year for decades. Wow. Larson picked up the phone and punched in a number. After a ring, a woman answered in a sing-songy voice. Lab, Tabitha here. Hey Tabby, I'm looking at the report you sent over. He tapped the pages in front of him. Are you telling me that something has been coming in and out of that ball pit for over three decades and it's been bleeding? It's weird, for sure, Tabby said. But yeah, the blood is from the same person. But each sample has degraded differently, indicating a different year for each one. You're onto something funky, Larson. That's one word for it. Thanks, Tabby. Larson hung up the phone and leaned back. Something bigger was going on here. Bigger even than having baffling glimpses into the past. He needed to find out more about the building where he'd found the pit. Maybe solving this mystery would lead him back to the Stitch Wraith. Strangeness seemed to radiate outward from the freakish thing. Whether the Stitch Wraith was evil or not, Larson wanted to find it and get to the bottom of whatever the heck was going on. Jake pushed through the shed's doorway. He carried a lumpy bundle wrapped in the folds of his cloak. Although the previous night's rain had stopped, the sky was still heavy with grey clouds. The sun was trying to break through them, but so far it wasn't having any success. Very little light made its way through the doorway into a small space when Jake stepped inside. Even in the murk, though, Jake could see that the girl was no longer curled up on the floor. She was sitting up. Jake closed the door and slowly approached the girl. He tried to hunch a little so his size wouldn't intimidate her. But he shouldn't have bothered. The girl looked up at him with no fear at all. Hi, the girl said in a sweet, scratchy voice. She'd said hi as if she were talking to a normal kid, so Jake responded as if he was. Hi, I'm Jake. What's your name? Jake, the girl said. That's a nice name. I'm Ronell. That's a nice name too, Jake said. Very pretty. 
As he spoke though, Jake felt funny about the girl's name. It sounded wrong to him, like it didn't fit her or something, but that was silly. Thanks, the girl said. Jake watched her and mentally repeated her name. Something sounded off about it, like it was a half-truth. The girl smiled at Jake. Jake stopped worrying about her name. He squatted down next to her and dumped the canned goods he'd foraged onto the floor next to her. She immediately reached out, grabbed a tin of tuna and, rugged, and tugged on its pull tab. I'm starving, Ronell said as she scooped tuna from the can with her fingers. Jake couldn't stop smiling. She looked so much better. Colour was back on her cheeks. Her eyes were bright and animated. Ronell had obviously finger combed her hair and straightened her clothing while Jake was gone. Her face was cleaner, so she must have spit scrubbed it. Weirdly, it looked like Ronell wasn't as skinny as she'd been when Jake had left her, but that was obviously impossible. Uh oh, it's a different child. Jake figured that Ronell's renewed energy made her look more substantial than she had when she was passed out. While Ronell ate, she looked around. Where are we? she asked with her mouth full. When she realised what she'd done, she giggled and covered her mouth with her hand. Sorry. Jake laughed. It's okay. He looked around the shed. We're near the railroad tracks. I wanted to get you some place no one comes to, away from those men. Ronell's pretty blue eyes widened. What men? The two men who looked like they wanted to hurt you, he hesitated. Should he tell her what he thought? He decided he should. He wanted them to be friends and he was always honest with his friends. I think they were your dealers. Ronell had finished the tuna and she was waiting for a can of peaches. She stopped and sucked in her breath. Her gaze darted toward the door. Where are they now? Don't worry, I took care of them. They're not going to find you here. Ronell returned her gaze to Jake. She shivered once, but then nodded. Thanks. She popped open the peaches and began slurping peach juice. Jake was amazed that Ronell didn't seem bothered by his appearance. She was treating him like an ordinary boy. You're not afraid of me, Jake. Wait, oh sorry, you're not afraid of me, Jake blurted. You helped me, and besides, Ronell ate a peach slice and looked Jake up and down. After she swallowed, she said, I've been on the street long enough to know that w what we think of as monsters, things that might look like you, aren't the real monsters. Mo most real monsters are people, especially guys who think they can push around girls like me just because I don't have a place to live. But you? You're not a monster. You just look different. I'm glad you think that, Jake said. He reached, he watched her eat. He wanted to ask her questions, but he wasn't sure if it was polite. Ronell finished the preachers and licked her fingers. She looked at Jake. You're wondering why I'm a druggie? Jake shook his head, but she was right. He did wonder. Ronell crossed her legs and hugged herself. My mum died when I was 13. Jake sat down next to Ronell. He thought about touching her hand, but he wasn't sure he should. I'm sorry, he said. I know what that's like. My mum died too. It's awful. Oh my god. Jake! <laughs> Ronell touched Jake's cloak. I'm sorry too. Yeah, it is. Her gaze drifted off past gay sh uh, Jake's shoulder. That was just two years ago, but it feels like forever. I was really close to my mum, and when she died, I was a mess and no one was there for me. What about your dad? Jake asked. Ronell shook her head. He was all wrapped up in his own grief, and he couldn't deal, you know? He disappeared into his work, got obsessive about it. He couldn't help me. She sighed. I tried to cope. I really did, but I finally couldn't stand the pain anymore. Ronell smiled at him. You're really nice. My dad didn't understand at all. He hauled me off to one of those schools for kids who get in trouble, and he left me there. When I got out, uh, he was still wrapped up in his work. I stole some of his money, and when he found out I'd done that, he kicked me out. Told me not to come back. I'm so sorry. Ronell shrugged and reached for another can. This one, a small tin of deviled ham. Deviled? De deviled. <laughs> deviled ham. She opened it and scooped out some of the salty smelling pink meat. She chewed, swallowed, and wiped her mouth with the back of her hand. Ronell concentrated on eating, but her eyes were shiny with tears. Jake could tell she loved her dad and missed him. He could intensely feel her loss. Watching Ronell polish off the deviled ham... <laughs> Uh, Jake decided he was going to find Ronell's father and get them reunited. He doesn't know how, but he was going to figure it out. 
The moment Jake made his decision, the sun won its battle with the clouds. A ray of golden light shot in through the shed smudged window and landed on Ronell. The light made Ronell look like a sweet angel, and it revealed something Jake hadn't noticed before. Ronell was wearing a very unusual pendant. Oh no. Hanging from a silver chain, the pendant was a somewhat misshapen silver heart. The puffy shape reminded Jake of things he'd seen in comic strips. This heart was the kind of heart he'd expected cartoon character to wear. It's not the same one um, that Eleanor gave Sarah, right? It, right? <laughs> oh no. No. The, the way the sun hit the silver made it glint and flash sparkles. The sparkles made Jake smile. He thought it was a sign that something good was going to happen. Are you kidding me? That's it? Oh. Ah, oh, nothing. Oh, what? Are you kidding me? There was like nothing there. Ah, oh. Boo. <laughs> no, uh, that was, that was okay. That was, it was, I, th I feel like it was more of a filler kind of part, but I, I can't wait for the finale of this. Um, there's only two more. There's only two more of these until the finale. But th that must be the necklace, right? The pendant. Huh. That's... Ah. Oh. oh. I, d I don't know how this is going to end. I don't have a clue. Um, so yeah, if you enjoyed this, then make sure that you subscribe for more audiobooks. I cannot wait to, uh, to start reading Friendly Face when it comes out. Um, but yeah. We're going to make some theory videos on some of these stories, so make sure you stick around for that. Anyway, I will see you later. Goodbye.